Hey everyone, welcome back to Cobra Kai Theory. Today we have a very special guest, Robert Mark Kamen, the creator of Karate Kid. Thank you for your time, sir. How you doing? My pleasure. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, so before we start off with a list of questions, uh, I got to ask, so was the crane kick legal? <laughs> That's funny. Of course it was legal. It was a defensive move. Right. Johnny was... Let's say, uh, you know, let's get off of this uh, fake conspiracy theory that Daniel was the bully. Daniel was defending himself. Johnny went to knock his block off. He jumped up in the air. The world was made right. So you've seen those conspiracy theories out there. Yeah, the people. I'm not on social media, but uh, Good. a bunch of people uh, called me and asked me for comment. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, let's give it a rest. Yeah, no, I hear yeah. you. So, um, you created an amazing movie that f I know for a lot of people has touched them very near and dear. And for me, it was something that was very special. I'll be 31 in a few weeks. So I saw it in 1996. I didn't get to see it in the theaters. Yeah, right. Uh, a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, like a lot of people. And But, you know, my, my dad was the one who introduced it to me. And he was very close with Japanese martial arts. And it was very ingrained in my upbringing. So thank you for everything that you did. I got to know what inspired you to make this story. Uh, what started you off? I know you have a martial arts background too. Right. I've been uh, training in martial arts in Okinawan Goju Karate for, since I'm 17. And I'm 73, so you can do the math. Um, and when this came to me, um, I had been training for uh, 17 years. So I was very steeped in traditional Okinawan karate do. And, um, you know, I'm in the make shit up business, dude. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's what I did. I had um, uh, my mentor was a man named Frank Price, who was chairman of Columbia Pictures. Mm -hmm. And he called me up and asked me if um, I love that bonsai tree behind you. That's fantastic. Thanks. Very funny. Um, yeah asked me if I knew anything about this stuff. And uh, he had uh, optioned an article from Jerry Weintraub, who was the producer, about yeah. a nine-year-old boy who got a black belt. Uh, in my world, in my karate world, nine-year-olds don't get black belts. Um, you train for a number of years. And in my, in my karate world, uh, getting a black belt, it's called shodan. It means first on. What it really means is beginning. And getting a, a black belt just means you're beginning your studies. Right. You're beginning to understand. You are let into the outer room of the inner sanctum of understanding wh exactly what it is you're doing. It's not punching and kicking. So I had been doing this for a number of years. And, um, and I had a story about uh, my teacher and... You know, except my teacher didn't speak English and he was not kind and gentle, but he taught by inference. He taught by example. He he had a Buddha heart. He was a very good man. And um, and I when Frank called me up, I said, uh, I have a story. It's not that story. And he bought it and I wrote it and they filmed it. And the rest is, you know, and for the last 38 years, I've been living more or less in and out of uh, Miyagi verse so well, and and now you're bringing it back with a musical uh i'd love yeah, to hear about that broadway musical I, yep. I i wrote the book and we have everything just the theater's closed uh we yeah. were scheduled to be in out of towns at this time but everything closed so it'll be put off a year and uh, now uh, daniel and mr maggie will be singing and dancing and doing the crane kick that'll be pretty interesting to see i wish i could see that is it you will to go back and do that now in a theater production how does that feel? Is it a little bit different in a sense, or is it just like riding a bike? No, it's I, I, Mr. Miyagi has never been out of my head for the last 38 years, perhaps because I, I train every day. I, yeah. I do, yeah. uh, I do my forms every day. Um, and, but Mr. Miyagi is always in my head because, you know, he's in everybody's head that really the karate kid is really about, it's about the relationship but it's really about Mr. Miyagi. It's, it is, he is the, he's the heart and soul 
of the Karate Kid. Yes. Um, and yes. so he, in a sense, never really, uh, never really leaves me. And now with Cobra Kai, I have all this swag, so I get to wear tons of Cobra yeah. Kai swag. So it's always in my head. Right, it's uh, everywhere, pretty much. Yeah, it's pretty. It's uh, what these three guys have done is pretty amazing. Um, they've been very true to the the three films, very true to them, and yet they have used them in original ways that which I just I'm always amazed when I see they do something like take the little girl in the bell tower during the storm and karate yeah. kid to them. all of a sudden she's the head of uh, the North American division of uh, whatever they called it motors. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I, I call them up and say, you, you people are shameless. And they just respond. They say, well, you wrote it. You know, she was in that bell tower. We just made her older. I yeah. Said, okay, whatever. Yeah. Everyone's waiting to see Freddie next from the very beginning. And that iconic oh. shirt. <laughs> Well, the shirt, there's a story to the shirt. So I'd love um, to hear it before we start uh, talking about Pat well, and Freddy, everything else. Freddie is going to be big in the musical. I mean, Freddie oh. plays a bigger role in the musical, and he has a song. Oh, cool. Yeah. Israel will be excited, really excited. The song got anything to do with that shirt? Because I want to get one of uh, those. No, nothing. The shirt was John and I found it in a flea market, and I yeah. said, wouldn't this be great to put it on somebody? And he said, it'll never get past the censors. And I said, well, uh, you know, let's try it. So we put it in wardrobe. Uh, Izzy put it on. He wore this thing. It got nobody ever. No, nobody ever said anything about it for many, many years. You know, well, I didn't even notice until I was in my late 20s. I watched right. it all my life. I watched it every night with me and my dad. I never noticed. And then someone right. made a comment. And I was like, oh, it's yeah, pig, it's pig porn. Yeah, literally <laughs> on his shirt. I'm like, yeah. I went through studio. Yeah. So uh, Kevin, the director of More Than Miyagi, put us in touch. And you know, big thanks to him. Um, I got a few questions regarding the film and the documentary and, and Pat sure. in general. Um, do you, th well, I, I know you didn't have any involvement directly with the documentary, but do you think it got the point across about what he was trying to portray? How do you think... It as, really Mr. as Mr. Miyagi or Mr. Miyagi as, 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 as Pat, his as his life. A lot of things I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time with Pat offset because uh, we hung out after hours. Um, yeah. And on set, I would be there and talking to him and stuff like that. Um, um, and I got to know Pat, not Mr. Miyagi. Um, but he... He was very funny, you know, he was a comic. Yeah. And to get to that place, to be Mr. Miyagi, he basically said, I channeled my father and my father's friends. Yeah. That's what he said to me. And he, he said, I just picked up their mannerisms, I picked up the way they talked, I picked up their tonal things, their cadences, and I made them my own. And he did, and he took, listen, I wrote, on a page, it's two dimension. It's a page, right? You read a line, yeah. like Mr. Miyagi. What belt do you have? Um, canvas, J.C. Penny, three ninety eight, mm -hmm. and and it's funny. And then he gives the little bit of wisdom. You know, okay, now a, a belt means you don't need to have rope to hold up your pants. Well, if you look at uh, the original pictures of Okinawans training, they are not training in with belts. If they have belts, they're just sashes. There was no such thing as a belt system. Yeah. I mean, nobody, there was none of this. Uh, when I first started training, there was only a white belt, a brown belt, and a black belt. And actually, the brown belt was just a sop to give to the American GIs who were going to the Okinawan dojo. And the Okinawan dojo were only open to them because the Okinawans had to make money. After World War II, they were destitute. So they opened up their dojo to these people. Okinawan people are very kind, very open people. They're an island people. Um, karate uh, is part of their culture as opposed to a sport. Um, they feel it in a different way. And, but they had to make a living. They had to earn money. And so they let, you know, they let Americans into their dojo. Um, and then they adopted the uh, Japanese belt system to make it you know, sort of more regimented. Um, 
training changed. Okinawan training changed. But we, we, we don't have to talk about karate. We're talking about Cobra Kai. So we, we can, can talk, talk about, about anything Pat. you want to talk. Yeah. Well, uh, your relationship with Pat, I mean, I'd love to hear more about it. There's, there's a picture that Kevin sent. I'm going to put up on screen here. Um, seems like you guys were pals. And he seems yeah. like a really cool guy on and off camera. Look at him. Um, he's super funny. Yeah. Yeah. He's super funny dude. Um, uh, he, if you watch the documentary, you see he had a hard life and he was, he, he was very determined to make it in a business that Japanese Americans do not go into. Mm. Um, um, and he was, um, he was, a, he was a pretty unhappy guy. He had a lot of pain that he carried. Um, you would not see it on screen and you would not see it when you hung out with him until it got deeper into the night where he drank more and he had a drinking problem. He, had, he was an alcoholic. Um, yeah. And he was funny until he wasn't. And it was sad to watch. Uh, but we had a great time. We used to go catting around in Honolulu because he knew every club and bar. And he, Danny, and I would go around after after hours and hang out. And they could drink way more than I could, um, and smoke more dope and stuff. But but we would run around the island. The people loved him, and he was great. But at a certain point in the evening, he he wasn't great. You know, he was he would well, just he had a lot out. of demons that he was dealing with. I mean, yeah, he was dealing with a lot of deep stuff. Uh, but he was he was the sweetest sweetest man. He was just the sweetest guy. He was great. Yeah. Um, and I had fun with him. When I saw him in later years, when I would go to Las Vegas, uh, I'd go there to, I have a wine, I live on a vineyard in, and I have a wine business. I'd okay. go to Vegas to sell wine and I would see Pat and he had really, uh, the alcohol had really taken its effect. And he, he would start out the evening sort of fine. He would have several drinks. And then as the evening went on, he, he just, you know, he just kind of lost it. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty to see. Um, but I loved the guy. He, he was great. And what he did for me was extraordinary. He took what was in my head and put it up there in a way that I never even envisioned. Yeah. Never, never in a million years did I. He was the embodiment of what I wrote. Literally yeah. the embodiment. And um, he added... He added to it in just his innum in just innumerable ways. He yeah, well, growing up for me, you know, his portrayal of Miyagi was something that I found solace in. You know, if I was going through a hard time, I'd kind of look to him as a guide. You know, he was the equivalent to to Yoda, and in a lot of senses, he was uh, right more personable, and he you could understand him a little better. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he, and he wasn't an animated character. He was a yeah. real person. And don't yeah. we all want somebody in our life like Mr. Miyagi, somebody who is yeah. kind and wise and has all the answers and can take our sadness and turn it into happiness and, if need be, beat the shit out of anybody who threatens us? Yeah, king of karate. We all, we all, yeah. we all want that. Yeah. You know, we all, we all want that perfect father figure. Um, you know, everybody wants Mr. Miyagi in their life. So, and Pat fit, fit the bill. Well, yeah. And there was a huge, um, audition process too. Wasn't there? Like he had to do that role a, a bunch of times I saw in the couple documentary. Of times, yeah. He, yeah. Came in, he, he actually came in three times and I think it was three. I, I was, um, I wasn't there. They were in LA doing it. I was in New York. And John called me up and said, I want to show you something. You know, I want you to see this. And this is before yeah. streaming and, 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 and everything else. And I got this tape, you know, overnight of the tape. And I watched the tape of Ralph and Pat. And I was floored by the chemistry there. I just looked and said, oh, my God, that's Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, He's amazing. This is Pat Morita. This is yeah. Arnold. Come on. Yeah. You know, he, he brought such a dignity to the role without losing his sense of humor and without having any self-importance. You know, um, other people read for the role, but they read it like 
they were samurai. They read it like they were karateka. Pat read it like he was a human, like he was secure in who he was. And that's what it was. And he became Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. And one of the things I like about Cobra Kai now is that they're kind of fleshing out his backstory a little bit. Is that sort of in line with what you had in mind? Or do you have your own story that you wanted to tell? And will you ever tell that story? I don't <laughs> no know if you comment. can say. No comment. Okay. No comment. All right. Okay. Stay, stay tuned. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, what do you think Pat would have, if he were here today, what do you think he would have thought of the documentary? Um, uh, I think he would have liked parts of it and parts of it would have been very painful for him to see. Yeah. Um, uh, it was very painful. He has two uh, older daughters who refused to participate in the documentary. And that part of his life was very painful for him. Very painful. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure he would have been very proud of the fact that somebody was making a documentary of, uh, of a life he had a fight so hard to get. I'm not sure that it wouldn't have caused him a lot of pain. Do you think, what do you think people will take away from it? Or what do you hope that they'll take away from it? That he was human. That he that that people have their struggles in life. That when you uh, all that glitters is not gold. That when you see somebody who has strived their whole life to achieve something and they finally achieve it, it comes with a price. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean you should stop striving to achieve it. You should. You should. You know. Keep going. I'm hoping people look at it and say, look what this guy accomplished. Look what, you know, despite the odds, despite the handicaps, everything else, look what he accomplished. And he, Pat Morita is, or Mr. Miyagi, is now enshrined as an iconic part of American culture. Look at, look at how many times you watch The Karate Kid. How many times did Mr. Miyagi light up your life? He lighted up my life in, in the way that I was a little kid and he built, you know, literal pillars of who I am today. So many, so many, I hear this from so many people, from so many people. And I wrote the character. I created the character. I drew from my experiences for the character, but I did not embody the character. Pat embodied him. Pat made him Mr. Miyagi. You know, you can read something on a page. It's one thing. But to see living flesh, he is Mr. He's Mr. Miyagi, you know. Yeah. And um, and he's given people tremendous amounts and will continue to. For who knows how long? I mean, uh -huh. you'll 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 sit with your kids and watch it. Oh, absolutely. You know? And my grandkids and, and, and they'll do the same because it'll be something that it was so important to me and introduced to me by my dad and. Um, you know, there's so many interesting lessons that you put in there for Miyagi's character. And one of the things that I really liked was, you know, when you're, you're a young kid, you, you want to be popular, you want to be this or that. And one of the things that he did for me was he's like, it doesn't matter. Like you don't need to show off with your belt. Like having this doesn't mean anything. Right. And that was something for me that really stuck in my head. I was like, oh yeah, who cares what color my belt? Cause I was in karate too. Right. I was like, who cares? What does it matter? Right. And I was always trying to get a you know different uh, stripe on the belt or a different color. It was like, doesn't matter, right? And so the you Okinawan, you... Okinawan karate uh, people that train in karate in Okinawa, traditional Okinawan karate, they never say um, what belt do you have. They never say uh, how good you fight. They always say he trains hard. And it embodies so much more. In other words, that you're trying, you're striving to perfect, to take this art and to respect it and to perfect it. Um, it's a difference between the sport karate and traditional karate, yeah. where you're always doesn't matter what belt you have, you know. Yeah. No. I haven't. A, I haven't worn. I have a very high ranking, but I haven't put on a a uh, an obi uh, my belt. Uh, or a gi, actually, in, I don't know, 25 years. I just don't, I train every day. I never put on an OB. Never. 
you know, because I don't go to a dojo, so it doesn't matter. But uh, you find the Okinawans, it's, uh, in part of the culture, it's kind of meaningless. Yeah. And Pat, in one line, brought that out. And it was so true. I mean, I wrote it okay, but he embodied it. Yeah. And when he said it, he ga it, he gave it truth. And that was that was his his gift. That was his Miyagi gift. Well, and he also said he didn't train for tournaments. He's like, what is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He trained for the, life. Yeah, trained for life. Right? Yeah. So That's, is that also something over there? They don't they don't do tournaments and stuff like this. Like, well, they do. There are some that they do now. The very mm -hmm. traditional schools do not. Uh, the very traditional schools, when I started training, did not have even have uh, kumite, jiu kumite. They didn't have sparring. They never the Oak, traditional Okinawan schools didn't have sparring. the The young, the young guys who wanted to spar would do it away from the dojo. So sensei didn't see. I don't think I, I started off with uh, one teacher um, doing an Okinawan style mm -hmm. uh, called Ishinru. Um, and he emphasized a lot of sparring because he was a fighter yeah. and that's what they emphasized. When I started training in traditional Okinawan Goju, there was never sparring ever. It was training in kata, training in, um, two man forms. It was all of that stuff. You did your warm ups, then you did, uh, some, um, organized punching and kicking and stuff. And then you broke apart and you just trained according to your ability. Since they would come around and say, do this, do that, um, do it this way, do it that way. Um, and, and nobody ever did kata together. Everybody did it at their own pace. It was, and, and uh, but uh, more and more the schools of uh, financial commercial pressure have become a little more like the rest of the world yeah so do you think that terry silver who's i gotta say one of my favorite characters uh yeah. <laughs> would you say he's like the complete opposite of what okinawan karate is about or he's just like uh, kind of a waste of time it's good for working up a sweat yeah that's him but more than that uh crease embodies the 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 worst aspects of karate. Oh, wow. I mean, Chris trains, you know, an enemy deserves no mercy. Yeah. A man faces you, he's the enemy. Now, in uh, oh, traditional Okinawan karate, you train in uh, bunkai, something called bunkai, which are two-man kata, and you train to help each other. This guy, you face a guy on the mat, you have to destroy him. Yeah the way I was taught is you're helping each other. You're helping each other. You might smash the guy and you know, you right. might bruise each other up, but you're helping each other. You're helping each other perfect their blocks. You're helping each other perfect their, their, their kicks, their punches, their strikes, their throws. That's the attitude you bring to the training. Yeah. Was Silver one of your favorite characters? Or I, I know he was kind of put in. I don't know the full story. Maybe you can elaborate. But it, Marty it, had a TV Marty, commitment. Yeah, right. Marty had a TV commitment. He couldn't be in the whole movie. I had to rewrite the script. Uh, like really fast. And Thomas came. And Thomas was a gift from heaven. Yeah. Because Thomas, he's... That's not Thomas. That over-the-top lunatic is not Thomas. Thomas is a fun, gentle, happy, really deep guy. He's really cool. Yeah. Um, Terry Silver is an insane lunatic, you know, and, and he was written that way because I had to get something that, uh, because Marty couldn't be in everything. Chris couldn't be in everything. I had to get something that was even worse that yeah. even took it, took it to a crazy higher level. And, and now he'll be in season four, uh, uh, and season five of Cobra Kai. Oh, I can't wait. Like I said, he's my favorite. I don't know why. He's just, he's just, he's like the, the, the Vader and the Emperor, him and Kreese. He, he is, he's, he's fun. Yeah, he's, he's fun. But, you know, I, I was talking to him before he went down to Atlanta to shoot season four. And I said, you know, the guys will do with you what they want, but it'd be great 
Thomas, if you just dialed down the insanity. Of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, well, when we meet him, he's in a bubble bath with with a glass of champagne. <laughs> You know. And a cigar, and he's just chilling there, and yeah, and, and, yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, but but we needed something that was as big that was bigger than Crease, and Crease was a big something. You yeah. know, Marty was a big, and Marty is a big presence. He's a big something. Yeah, and so we needed something else, and and he was it. Marty is is, you know, this solid, serious rock, and this guy is, you know, he's Loki. He's, he's yeah. just. He's, he's just out of his mind, but funny. The world's but a playground out. to him. That's how that's how it hit me. And he's just this rich guy and billionaire, and he's just he's just having fun. Everything's yeah. at his disposal. Everything's a joke to him, and 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 his wor- He can indulge his worst tent- uh, fantasies. Yeah, you know, yeah. because he can. You know. Anyway, so you brought Mike Barnes in there. Uh, are you are you able to actually talk about your original script for it before the the reshoots or is that a no no uh, no it kind of all melded together because it you know it, or the it, rewrite I should say Karate Kid three was not I didn't want to do it really I had I had a different idea no oh, okay. I wanted to do you remember Crouching Tiger yeah okay flying a Chinese flying people movie. I wanted to do a Chinese flying people movie. I wanted to do the origins of um, the Miyagi family karate. I wanted to do it in a dream sequence and Mr. Miyagi and a girl wake up the way Mr. Miyagi's ancestor got drunk fishing and woke up in China. I wanted to do Mr. Miyagi waking up in China with a girl in a boat and it's a fantasy thing. And there were two warring Chinese villages and they, uh, it's a fly, it was a Hong Kong flying people movie with Mr. Miyagi and a girl and everybody learns something and it's really wonderful. And the studio didn't want it. They, yeah, wanted, they wanted the same thing over again. Daniel meets a girl, there's a villain, etc. And I took a pass. I said, that's not my idea of what I want to do. And I pitched them my idea and they rejected it. And so I went on my merry way. The guy who rejected my idea the head of the studio, uh, uh, Guy McElwain, may he rest in peace, uh, and Jerry Weintraub, may he rest in peace, they rejected my idea. They didn't want to do that. And they hired somebody else. But um, there's nobody, and I'm not saying this with any, um, there's no ego attached to this. Mm -hmm. Nobody else could write Mr. Miyagi. I agree with that. Well, yeah, you're the creator. I am Mr. Miyagi. Hell, yeah. <laughs> I have the T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, uh, it, it wasn't just the creator. It's that I kn- understood his voice because I was steeped in his culture, in in the culture of uh, Okinawan martial arts and kind of the nature of Okinawan people. And I knew that yeah. stuff. And so I turned it down. And then my friend Dawn Steele, may she rest in peace, became chairman of the studio. And she, I ran into her one day in, in a restaurant in New York, and she said, look, um, I need this movie for my slate. I'm, I'm building a slate here, but I need this movie, and you have to write it. And I said, no, I, I want to do my movie. And she said, uh, I'll give you this ridiculous amount of money if you do our movie. And I said, I'm in the movie business. I'm a screenwriter. Sure, yeah, you yeah. Just, I, I'm ready. <laughs> you know? Do what you got to do. Yeah. She, she paid me a lot of money. And yeah. I wrote it's not my favorite movie they everybody did the best job they could mm-hmm. but uh you know and then like three weeks before we're going to do principal photography marty has this tv show and so i have to scramble and i was in australia at the time uh, doing yeah. the punisher with dolph lundgren and um cool what i didn't know this yeah Dolph's one of my favorite actors what the hell i love dolph yeah, well, wow, that Rocky Four is—I gotta say, you know—he uh, was the most amazing, most amazing, most uh, amazing. But yeah. that's the genius of Sly. Yeah. Sly is a genius at this. So and so, the first Expendable movie, which I came on to Script Doctor with Sly on, um, there's Jet Li, who I had done two <laughs> movies with. There's Dolph, who I did The Punisher with. There's Jason Statham, Statham who I did three movies with. Yep, they, I mean. 
every person in that movie I had done, <laughs> I had done movies with. It was yeah. uh, that was a funny experience. That was odd, very very odd. Um, and um, and I had to rewrite this thing and rewrite this part, and 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 I did it. I didn't. The movie was tough to to shoot. It was hard because everybody. You know, it was just tough. It was it was tough all the way around. Yeah. And and I didn't want to tell the same story again, but we ended up I'm sorry, we ended up telling the same story just with small twists and trying to make the same thing different. And and it did not perform as well as the first two movies performed because people smelled it. They smelled that it wasn't fresh, wasn't original, you know. Well, the first one was original. Second one was original. The third one tread treaded along the same lines as I'd say the first one. But More you know less. what, man? It was still it was still one of my favorites. I mean, they were all they all hold a special place in my heart. But uh, the characters, I don't know. Terry Silver for me, just, that was yeah. Oh, I, yeah. He was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was badass. I mean, like, I don't know. He was like a cartoon. Plus, yeah. Thomas was the only person in the cast that knew martial arts. Mm -hmm. He was a black belt in Taekwondo. So he knew martial arts. Sean, so he, didn't Sean Cannon know too? Eh, maybe a little. Okay. He, uh, I mean, I think he says he does, but he a little. You know, I, okay. I don't really know. I didn't spend a, I didn't spend much time with Sean, so okay. I, I couldn't tell you. I spent a lot of time with Terry Silver with Thomas because he was, aside being, you know, this over the top guy, he was just a great guy to be around. He's a wonderful person. Yeah, he seems like a fun so, guy. Well, when he was yeah. doing those kicks, when he was warming up with Daniel, I was like, "This guy's kind of right. legit." I mean, the, oh, yeah, he, was, really he, was, he was really, he was really legit. Yeah, he was really legit. But I like guys that kick high because the Okinawan Goju style is a six-inch style. It's done. What does that it's mean? Done six. Well, you, you, uh, my teacher used to say, if if somebody can't reach you, you you don't have a fight. And so the fight only a fight only takes place within six inches of you being near another person. And the idea of being six inches from another person takes away a lot of their weapons. It takes away those big, long legs that Thomas has. He can't use them if I'm six inches away from him. But I can use everything I've learned because my style is geared towards the fight is here. Right. The fight is here. The fight is not here right right kind of like rocky four when rock just goes right in for the stomach because he's right too short right got it exactly. so with okinawan karate was doing house chores kind of like a way of uh where'd you no. get that idea because that's i made it up. i'm in the make shit up, you made it up? all right yeah i got it okay well it's no it, it, I, I just took what i knew the real blocks you know rising block and and right. um middle blocks and down blocks. And I just took them and I just made stuff up. That's all. Um, I could do that to a certain degree. And then after a while you run out of funny things to do. Like the drum, the descaden in, uh, I got that from probably one of the greatest karate men in Okinawa, who's also dead now, Choki Kishaba, who was a Shorinru stylist. And I went to meet him and watch him work out one day and, and at the end, we were all sitting around eating dinner after training. And I asked him what, if you had to break karate down to the essence of what is it? And he picked up this drum and he said, this is the essence of it. No way. And I said, what? Yeah. And he stood up and he showed me exactly what Daniel does. The, it's all, everything is circles. Everything is deflection. And it's taking somebody's energy and using it against themselves, moving it back, moving it back. You know, and, and so I looked at that and I said, oh, man, you just saved me a lot of work. This is, <laughs> this is really easy. Yeah. And when they start doing it, you know, when everybody starts rubbing that the drum in Karate Kid 2, it was pretty fantastic. Because yeah. y Yuji, Chosen, he mm -hmm. does, never learns that lesson. All he is is pure aggression. Yeah. He's like Johnny, I guess, in a sense. Why... Didn't Sato teach him that? Well, what, what was the difference between Sato's karate? Because I mean, they were taught by Miyagi's dad. Was it just because that what Sato? Yeah, because what Sato took from it was aggression. 
-hmm. He did not take him. Sato was devoid of compassion. Mm -hmm. And karate teaches you compassion. You, um, what we, uh, to start all every session when you would work with somebody or you would, uh, your sensei would stand in the front of the dojo and you would start and you would bow and say, Onigashimas, please teach me, please yes. help me, please instruct me, Onigashimas. And you would always say that. And that's what Sato did not have. Sato had, he took the aggressive part from the system. He didn't take the compassionate part from the system the way Mr. Miyagi did. Mr. Miyagi believed that uh, karate is for defense only. And he says, karate is for defense only. You uh, look for revenge, start by digging two graves. Yes. Sato didn't yes. believe that. Sato believed karate was aggressive. That's how he becomes wealthy. That's how he becomes who he is, by being aggressive. By being, he was angry his whole life. The guy was angry about Pat, yeah. about Mr. Mr. Miyagi. He was angry his whole life. And anger is aggression. You know, anger turned inward is aggression. And Mr. Miyagi was full of compassion. It was the light and dark side. That's what you created. Yeah, more yeah. or less. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um it well, as irrelevant but something i always wanted to know sato and and silver who do you think would win oh come on <laughs> <laughs> i love those matches those team ups just like yeah, Johnny Jet Lee, versus Mike Barnes. Jet Li and jackie chan who would win yeah chosen <laughs> Mike Barnes, who wins yeah i always wanted to know um do you think they'll ever remake i hope not do you think they'll ever remake the karate kid they did they made it with Will Smith's kid. Uh, what's his name? Jaden. Right. Yeah. And I've, and, I've and they got it. away with it. And they got away with it because it was the original film. But, you know, technically it was okay, but it lacked. You can't do heart twice. Mm. You can't, you know, and that's what it lacked. It was just, it did well, did very well at the box office. Didn't do very well overseas, I think, but it did really well at the box office. But it lacked the compassion. It's why... It's why most people, when they're going to show their kid, the Karate Kid, they show yeah. them Karate Kid 1, right? It's why they go for that. Yeah, it hits um, different. Yeah, it's different. And and the difference was Mr. Miyagi. I mean, Pat was the difference. Yeah. Yeah, he struck gold with that guy. He's, oh, my and God. And what you said with the, the two-dimensional – page thing and how he took that and it's like he didn't really have any coaching from you or anything he just kind of did the part and that was it he just read the lines and just he told me he said i channeled my father and his friends how they talked what their cadences were the way they sort of behaved and he just embodied it there's no other actor on earth who could have done what he did he took his life experience and turned it into that and it and it was quite amazing. He would do it. it. was funny to be with him and watch him turn the switch on and off. Oh, that must have been cool. No, it was pretty funny because Pat in real life was a guy. He was a joker. You know, he was a complete joker. Um, and uh, and he could just turn it on and off. He could do Mr. Miyagi and then he could be Pat. You know, and he was great. It, it was really, great. it was... Amazing. There was no other actor who could have done that and and done what he had done with it. Yeah. Were there you know, any... Gonna... Sorry, go ahead. It's going to be uh, interesting in our casting process to find the actor for the musical that can do that. Do you have anyone can... in mind that you can say? Mm, I can't say. Okay. Not yet. All right. Well, I guess we'll find out. Um, yes, we will. Were there any deleted scenes that nobody has ever gotten to see? Something that you really wanted, but maybe the studio didn't. What the studio the didn't want. What the studio didn't want was the drunk scene, and oh. I had a, I, I had to appeal to. I had to go directly to Frank. They wanted to cut it because it made right. the movie. With that, the movie was two hours and six minutes, which meant you got one less show a day for the exhibitors, and that meant one less show of buying popcorn and soda and you know everything that kept movie theaters open. 
And so they wanted to cut that scene because they felt it slowed the picture down. And I felt it was the most, I felt after, after the wax on wax off yeah. scene with Daniel and uh, Mr. Miyagi, I felt that was the most important scene in the movie. And I went, I appealed directly to the chairman of the studio who was my mentor. So it was easy. And I said, please, please, please test it, you know, keep it. Listen, and I gave him all my reasons and he kept it to his credit. He kept that scene in the movie. And that scene is the big emotional moment of the movie. Yeah. Well, it humanizes him. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, uh, look, look, it's so long ago. I don't, uh, there's so much I don't remember. I'm trying to think of scenes that we had that didn't work and I don't, I don't, I just don't remember. Did uh, you know that this was going to be as big as it is? I mean, at the oh, time, no. probably not, but no, I thought I wrote a, a very sweet little movie. I was amazed it got made, but it got made because Frank had a vision. Frank Price had a vision. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be $30 million at the box office and gone. And then it became this thing. The first time I was aware of it, uh, John and I slipped into a theater on Third Avenue in New York, the Cinema One Two Three. It was called the Bar It was called the Coronet at the time, Baronet and Coronet. And we sat in the back, and when, and we heard people laughing, and when they did the final tournament scene, and Daniel jumps up and does the crane kick, people in the audience, and this is like a nine o'clock at night adults jumped up and cheered and we looked at john and i looked at we hugged each other like rhesus monkeys and we said it works it works it works it's amazing that's what ron thomas was saying when i was uh when i interviewed him too he said he was at a premiere with you back in the 80s and then uh when the crowd cheered you turned to him and he said this is a hit we got a hit or something like that so I, I guess I you probably yeah, probably don't that. remember but he, I, mean, he I remember john and i I mean, John and I were uh, were together. I I uh, I didn't really know the Cobra Kai kids. Yeah, I mean, they mm -hmm. were just they were just there. You know, they were just kids. I only got to meet them afterwards when they would show a revival, and I would show up sometimes, and I got to meet them afterwards. And then all of a sudden, I'm looking at them, and they're not the 17 year olds I knew. <laughs> they were 30 year old people. You know. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I forget. I, I, as a fan, I don't know the movie industry. I mean, like, of course, like you do. I didn't realize that there are so many. The two-hour, six-minute thing with the popcorn and all that. I mean, I didn't. It was a big thing. You had to keep a movie under two hours because you get one extra show a day. That's stupid. It, no. I know, it's it's movie, money. It's money. I know. But it's, the but... movie, the theater owners make money on the popcorn and soda. Yeah. That's where they make their money. From a story know? aspect, though, I'm like, well, you're going to cut this out for the. But I get it. I get it. I understand. Um, well, I feel like I've pretty much asked you everything. Um, is okay. there anything? Well, I mean, we could talk um, for hours and hours. But... I can go back to work. You know. Yeah, it's... yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, That's okay. Is there is there anything you would like to say before we sign off? And and uh, for everyone who wants to watch more than Miyagi, if you haven't seen it already, you can watch it on iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, Vudu, and Google Play. Um, Robert, it's been a pleasure. Is there anything you'd yeah, like to say? I, yeah, I in just addition? in terms of Cobra Kai, I see yeah. you have the hat on. Dude, I got the hat. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like swag. Um, mm -hmm. That what these three guys have done is extraordinary. I mean, they have now introduced through the back door of Cobra Kai, they've introduced a billion more people to the Karate Kid, <laughs> and and they are what they've done is so original and so interesting. Even though they're working off of a trope, they're working off of my original material. They have made they have made it interesting and fresh and contemporary, and it's amazing what these three guys have done. It's just amazing. Yeah, I think it's because they're fans. It doesn't feel when I watch oh, it, it doesn't feel like they're milking it. it you know, it, it feels fans. real. They know more about the films than I do, and they bring stuff up, and I'm like, oh, that's in the film. Oh, okay, you know, cool. All right, whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I can't wait to see, you know, where they're going to go with season four and see my favorite character come back that you created. Yes. And he's back. Uh, he's back. Terry Silver is back big. Oh, dude. I can't wait. He was just such a staple for me growing up. He probably shouldn't be because he's a, kind of an asshole. Oh, no. I mean, I can't believe he was that's perverted. 
You yeah. Know, you're like, you're in love with the guy who is the sickest man in the entire <laughs> franchise. Maybe because I was, uh, I don't know, quote unquote, a good kid. And I'm like, oh, here's a guy who just doesn't care. You know, he doesn't and care. He's, he's rich fun. and he doesn't care. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything to him was fun. I mean, that yeah. opening scene in the bathtub is like you're in, a, you're in a jacuzzi with a, I think he was getting a massage, smoking a cigar and drinking a glass of champagne. Oh, he was like, it's, it's crazy. And then he's like, I, I like that, Johnny. I think I'm going to yeah. use that. Yeah. And he just goes yeah. insane. And I'm like, this guy is freely like a cartoon character. He was insane. Yeah. He was oh, like you. a big cartoon character. Okay. Oh, you, you, you killed it. All right. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate Thanks, it. Man. I really much appreciate love. it. See you Thank later. Thanks so much for everything. Bye. Bye.